Okay, welcome everybody. Looks like we are live. Um, just gonna wait for a few people to get on here. We are going to be celebrating the great uh, Jim Steinman today, who uh, remembering Jim. Great, uh, great legendary producer and songwriter. And uh, as we wait for a few people to get on, uh, I want to recognize our, our sponsor, which helps to make this possible, uh, Zenny Hour. I just got some new Zennies in the mail, so uh, go check that out, zenny.com. In fact, I'm going to open these up after. So um, Jim Steinman was like, he was the king of the mini epic. And uh, I feel like he was such a, we, we talk about this a lot on this channel. If you haven't uh, known this by now, I am uh, very much for the underdog. And Jim Steinman was definitely one of the great unsung heroes of, of 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, I, I feel like um, very underappreciated. Let's go through his career. Some some uh, key parts in the one. I'm going to do my uh, Jim Steinman uh, fiver, my top five Jim Steinman uh, uh, performances. And uh, please let me know as, as we go through what yours are. Uh, but uh, when he was a, a senior at uh, Amherst College in Massachusetts, Jim wrote the book and music and the lyrics for the Dream Engine. That was in 1969. And uh, I believe that he did that to fulfill the requirements uh, for an independent study course that he had. And uh, the play was presented uh, at Amherst um, uh, at the campus. Uh, I believe it was the Kirby Theater. And uh uh, then it was transferred to a nearby uh, uh, theater for a handful of performances. And it, was, it was controversial at the time uh, as uh, with local authorities. I guess that it, uh, it's ensemble wide display of nudity um, in the finale. And uh, what's interesting about that, uh, that play that he wrote though, is that there were a few motifs and lyrics and monologues that uh, from the dream engine, that uh, made la later appearances in some of Steinman's songs. Uh, he actually said, turn around bright eyes. That made his way, of course, in Total Eclipse of the Heart. Uh, that's in the song, The Formation of the Tribe. And um, it's actually originally a reference to uh, the blast flash of nuclear explosions. And then uh, I guess the, the full riff of the original Dream Engine composition is in the musical break of uh, the, the Bonnie Tyler recording as well, uh, with the musical blast to punctuate you know certain phrase each phrase. Uh, there's also references to silver and gold throughout, and that would appear in uh, you know from a song out of Bat Out of Hell. And he did that a lot. I guess he also he did that in another song that he had for a musical that he wrote. Uh, the song was for Sarah. It was in uh, the Confidence Man. Uh, some of that music would later appear in Making Love Out of Nothing at All. And so where he really got his start, um, in 1972, Bette Midler sang a demo of Heaven Can Wait. And uh, that was before Bette was a, a big star. She'd go on to greater fame after that. But uh, that demo was a collector's item, and I think that it's been circulated on the web. And, um, and then, of course, the, the first song, uh, that was commercially released uh, as a Jim Steinman um, composition was uh, Food of Love. It was sung by Yvonne Elliman. Um, and so uh, th just kind of going through some some uh, key parts of his career leading up to uh, the blockbuster that would be Bad Out of Hell. Um, in, in that same year, I believe it was in 73, he wrote music and lyrics for the musical more than you deserve. And that is where he met Meatloaf. And then um, he, uh, another kind of interesting thing is that he he worked on, uh, uh, contributed music and lyrics to uh, Kid Champion, which also starred a young Christopher Walken. That's kind of interesting. So uh, in uh, 1977, there's a brief workshop that uh, was held for a musical title titled Neverland, and uh, it was adapted largely from uh, the Steinman uh, source material developed for the Dream Engine, which I previously mentioned. 
and uh, and that actually was, is what would come some become some of the music for Bad Out of Hell. And uh, while preparing the show, uh, Jim Steinman and Meatloaf, who were touring at the time with the National Lampoon show, felt that a lot of these songs were exceptional and that they began to develop it as part of a seven song set that they wanted to record as an album, which of course became Bad Out of Hell. Uh, Heaven Can Wait and the formation of the pack, which was uh, retitled All Revved Up with No Place to Go. And uh, for those of you that don't know the story of Bad Out of Hell, it's incredible that uh, they were rejected by everybody. Um, they had a really hard time getting that recorded and released. Uh, they spent most of 1975 uh, and, and, and two and a half years, really, auditioning Bad Out of Hell. They were rejected, like I said, by every, even, even CBS executive Clive Davis, the great Clive Davis, he claimed that Steinman knew nothing about writing uh, or rock music in general, which is really interesting. Uh, thank you very much to, uh, there's a boon to 713. Uh, asking for more 90s. Yeah, more 90s to come. We've done a lot of interviews uh, with 90s artists, so look for that. So back to it. Um, so they recorded the album, and uh, it was released by Cleveland International Records in October of 1977. Uh, the album was an immediate success in Australia, then the United Kingdom, and of course later in the United States. It took a while in the U.S., though, uh, it's one of only nine albums in the history of popular music to have sold over 40 million copies worldwide. It's been certified 14 times platinum by the RIAA. Um, and uh, to date, it's spent over 522 weeks in the UK albums chart. Uh, there's only two albums that have spent more times in, the, uh, in those album charts, and that's Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, and Fleetwood Mac Rumors. That's how big Bad of the Hell was or is. In fact, we will, uh, we're going to, we're going to do a piece on Bad Out of Hell as I was uh, kind of looking through this and, and researching, you know, Jim's career. And of course, I know the music pretty well. Uh, but uh, as I was looking through his career, as he's passed, you know, when he passed away and, and looking through all the achievements, um, Bad Out of Hell has, has just got such an incredible story behind it. I, I definitely think we need to do a a breakdown and we will, especially of, of a lot of the songs. Uh, my dad was a big uh, meatloaf fan. I remember as a, as a kid I was, then I got into high school and I was kind of too cool for school. Uh, wouldn't admit that I loved it or that I, that I liked it. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I've, I've later grown to appreciate it. Um, and, uh, so, so anyway, Steinman reflected that the album was, timeless truly timeless because it didn't fit any trend and uh it's never been part of what's going on he said that it could have been released at any time and it wouldn't have been a part of what was popular it would have seemed out of place no matter what decade that it was released in i think that's very interesting uh like i said response to the album was very slow especially in the u.s uh, of course uh for many of you probably know but uh, some may not todd rundgren produced bad out of hell he even asserts that it was very much uh, underpromoted by the record label, having a reputation of you know being damaged goods because it had been walked around to so many places and rejected. And uh, so the way that it did so well in the UK, for example, uh, Wayland Tide, thank you, oh, thank you very much. Keep it up. I appreciate that. Uh, is that um, they played a clip. Uh, music video clip that they had made this of course was before mtv and it was played on the old gray whistle test and uh it did so well that they played it again the next week and uh as a result in the uk they had actually asked the band to come perform paradise live paradise by the dashboard light and uh i guess it was like this uh unfashionable uncool non-radio record that was like a must-have for everybody that who heard it, they went immediately went out and got it. And, um, you know, Steinman's uh, unique perspective is, is what made this so special Canada. It, it was huge. In fact, meatloaf was like in Toronto, especially he was like, the, there was like Beatles esque, you know, Beatlemania type uh, exposure in Toronto. Uh, it was because, uh, 
Chum FM played it. Uh, they really had to get everybody on board with it. But uh, when they played it there, they put it on regular rotation and it just blew up in Canada. And, uh, you know, when Meatloaf went down there to tour, it, that, that he exploded there. And then Australia. In Australia, it's actually the biggest selling album there. It sold 1.7 million copies in Australia. Um, so just, just incredible. Of course, a musical style, a bat out of hell. It was influenced by uh, Steinman's appreciation uh, for Richard Wagner, Phil Spector. The Wall of Sound was was a huge influence. Bruce Springsteen and The Who. Uh, Tommy was a big influence. Now, um, a lot of people have compared it to Springsteen because it came out at the time of, of Born to Run. But uh, Steinman said that it was more uh, in, in interviews said that the Springsteen wasn't really an influence. It was more of a feeling. And so, you know, the key tracks on there, uh, you took the words right out of my mouth, Hot Summer Night. That went to number 39 on the Hot 100. That was actually re-released after uh, it did so well uh, because U.S. was really the last place that it hit. Two out of three ain't bad. That, of course, the biggest hit from the album went to number 11. And there's an interesting story about two out of three ain't bad for Jim Stein. When, when he was writing it, there was somebody from uh, uh, that was in one of the, the musicals that he was working on from the cast who was saying, yeah, why don't you just write something simple? And uh, oh, thank you very much uh, from uh, Victoria. Uh, home proud. Uh, Woot for Toronto. Yeah, great. Um Two out of three ain't bad. Anyway, a cast member said to him, why don't you just write something simple? You always write these epics, you know, these, these longer songs. You know, why not something simple? And so he, he actually thought of the song Elvis Presley's I Want You, I Need You, I Love You. And that was uh, a huge influence on that song. And so instead of I want you, I, I need you, I love you, you know, he says, you know, I want you, I need you, but there ain't no way I'm ever going to love you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be sad because two out of three ain't bad, of course. Uh, so still a somewhat of a twist, but he said it was the closest thing to a simple song that he'd ever written and one that even Elvis could have done. And that was the biggest song from that album. Paradise by the Dashboard Light, you know, in three parts, you know, Paradise, Let Me Sleep On It, which I've always loved that, and uh, Praying for the End of Time. Uh, that's just an epic. It's just, it, it just, uh, so creative how he put that together. I, I, I just really sincerely love that song. And it's again, this, and then, and then the baseball part will, where, where Phil Rizzuto, there's an interesting story there as well. That I'll go into a little bit later, how he recorded the play by play. I thought that was just genius, how he put that together. And again, Steinman just very, very underappreciated. And uh, so, you know, for a period in 1983, this is a very interesting thing that, uh, of course, I knew as a little kid when I was listening to the American Top 40 Countdown with Casey Kasem. Uh, Steinman had two songs in the top two spots. Uh, he had, uh, of course, Total Eclipse of the Heart when that went to number one for four weeks. Three of those weeks, Making Love Out of Nothing at All by Air Supply was at number two. So he was at the number one and number two position. Not very many people have done that. And uh, then he also he worked with Barry Manilow, if you didn't know, uh, on his Greatest Hits 2 compilation, included the song Read Him and Weep. And that was number one for eight weeks on the AC charts. Just kind of giving you a little bit of, of, a, of a look into that Jim Steinman could really work in any uh, in any. Uh, genre he could he could do anything in the 70s he was successful in the 80s going into uh in 85 oh thank you so much daniel uh Willett. greetings from maine oh wow well, thank awesome great to see you uh daniel so uh in 1985 uh this is this is something for some of the 80s kids on here steinman wrote composed and produced the theme song for wwf uh, Hulk Hogan on the, the wrestling album was the WWF All-Stars Hulk Hogan's theme. He actually later put lyrics to it and somebody else recorded it. Uh, and then he did uh, Pandora's Box, the all-female group uh, in 1989. Original Sin was the album there. And uh, uh, The Harsh Truth just asked, just want to say I love your channel. Keep it up, brother. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, and so uh, Original Sin 
didn't do much commercially, but it, it really revitalized uh, Jim's creativity. And of course, he came back in the 90s, hit the top of the charts in the, in the 90s with the sequel, Bad Out of Hell 2, Back Into Hell. And uh, it's interesting, even though he had this album that had done so well in the late 70s, uh, the Jughead won. Another legend lost, Adam. Greetings. Uh, greetings to you from the UK. Oh, thank you. Love your 70s pieces. Well, much more to come there. Rest in peace, Jim Steinman, for sure. After all the success that Jim Steinman had had in the 80s, I mean, he's at number one and number two, and then he has this album that had sold so well, was just a juggernaut of the late 70s, blockbuster album. Bad Out of Hell too. you would think that people would be excited about. It was actually the exact opposite. It was considered a joke by many people. They didn't think it would do anything. A lot of disrespect thrown his way, um, and uh, very un and uh, you know just very unenthusiastic. Um, not much uh, excitement about the idea of a comeback, and uh, the immediate success of Bad Out of Hell too. I mean, it sold 15 million copies. The single, I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that, uh, went to number one. But, of course, Meat Loaf and Lorraine Crosby. Another interesting thing is that um, Cher and uh, uh, Melissa Etheridge and I believe Bonnie Tyler were all considered for that duet with Meat Loaf on that song. Uh, the song went to number one in 28 countries. Incredible. And, uh, and so uh, he also was uh, nominated and won a Grammy for Best Rock Vocal Performance for I'll do anything for love. Uh, I myself was not a huge fan. Again, when that came out, I was in high school. I was the new waiver. I was too cool for school. Um, couldn't admit that I loved uh, the likes of the Billy Joels and the Meatloaf. And of course, I've learned since then that there is no such thing as a guilty pleasure. We like, we like good music. If it lasts, it's, you know, it, it, and it has lasted. Jim Steinman stuff it will last forever. Uh, but, uh, the song was number one, uh, I'll Do Anything for Love, uh, in the UK chart for seven weeks consecutively. Uh, Fake or Aorta, the music you wrote for Streets of Fire. Yep, we're get, we're going to get to that for sure. And then uh, Celine Dion's album, uh, uh, one of the, or, or uh, fall, what was it, Falling Into You, um, yeah, it came out in 96. It's All Coming Back to Me Now, which was written years before that. That was a huge hit. Um, in, in 96 and it actually won Steinman the award for BMI song of the year. So in the nineties, the guy took over and again, he could do any genre, any performer. And, and like I said, very underappreciated. There were a lot of interesting might've been's in his career. I'll give you an example in 1984. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Jim Steinman was hired and worked briefly with Def Leppard uh, on some of the tracks that would be later become hysteria. And uh, he was fired and the recording work that he's done with the band was never released. It would be interesting to hear that. Uh, and of course, they ended up working with Mutt Lang again. But I would love to hear what, the, what that, those productions sounded like. And then Steinman actually, in an interview later on, would say that uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber had approached him to write lyrics for the fan of the opera. Uh, but, you know, because he said that Andrew Lloyd Webber felt that his... Uh, his dark, obsessive side would fit the project very well, but Steinman was already committed to a Bonnie Tyler's album at that time. So uh, a couple of might have been's that would have been huge there. And uh, he also was prepping the stage musical based on the Batman comic book series, which Tim Burton was supposed to direct. It was supposed to have the, the look and the feel uh, of the first two Batman movies that Tim Burton did. And uh, some of those songs have been released. So... Uh, a lot of people have said many things about Jim Steinman, both good and bad. Uh, but you just look at the body of work and incredible, incredible composer and producer. Uh, some have called him the greatest composer of symphonic rock. And I don't disagree with that. Um, he's been such an influence on a variety of bands and genres. And I mean, not to mention the musical Bad Out of Hell, which did well and, and so many others that he's worked on. He just... He brought Broadway to rock and roll. And whenever you do that, the critics are never going to give you uh, a fair shake. I mean, that's what many have said about Billy Joel. I've even heard people say that about Elton John. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, but, um, you know, one of the interesting things is that uh, responding to an interviewer's uh, 
assertion that his songs are very tragic. Uh, Steinman said at the time that he's never, uh, never been stomped on literally, figuratively. He says, I'm stomped on every day. Anyway, that's the way I feel sometimes. I've never had my heart broken the way that uh, you're talking about. I've never been dumped, but probably because I don't allow myself to be dumped. I thought that was an interesting quote. Um, Jim Steinman, again, um, I think that uh, his work will be much more appreciated now that he's, he's gone. And, and as people reflect on the size and scope of his vision, I always loved his quote. If you don't, you know, because everybody always said that he was so over the top. You know, he said, if you don't go over the top, you can't see what's on the other side. I love that quote. I think that's that, that sums it up perfectly. Um, uh, JE23508, to keep up the fantastic music history professor, we will. We will se- continue to celebrate it. So with that, let's get into uh, my Jim Steinman top five. And uh, I, I want to start with an honorable mention. Um, Tonight is what it means to be young from Streets of Fire. Love that song. Love that movie. Uh, I know that they were trying to, they named it after a Springsteen song. They were trying to get the rights to Springsteen's music. Of course, I Can Dream About You by Dan Hartman was the big hit there uh, from that soundtrack. But uh, Steinman actually wrote a couple of songs for that. Uh, uh, Nowhere Fast was the other one. And uh, it was, uh, of course, composed and produced uh, by Steinman. And it was credited to Fire Incorporated which uh, some of those members were later on uh, would, would be in Pandora's box. Uh, so Fire Incorporated, which it was a reference to an assembly of studio musicians and singers that were hired for those two songs. Now the voice heard on these songs, Rory Dodd, who was a, a frequent collaborator uh, with, with Steinman many times and uh, Holly Sherwood and Laurie Sargent. And uh, of course it was lip synced by Diane Lane in the movie. So that's my honorable mention. Uh, so number five, number five, I'm going with paradise by the dashboard light. I just love the three parts. I love the longer version. Of course they shortened it for radio, but that's just a classic. And we'll go more, de- more in depth on that when we do our piece on bad out of hell, uh, holding out for a hero is my number four. I've always, I've always loved that song. I think Bonnie Tyler has just got such a husky voice and it's, it's just an amazing voice. And of course, from uh, Footloose, 1984, the greatest music or greatest year in pop music ever, in my opinion. And uh, this song by Bonnie Tyler, uh, Steinman produced it, uh, and he he is credited with, of course, composing the music. Dean Pitchford, who wrote most of the the, the music, I think all of the music on Footloose, he wrote Footloose, he wrote Let's Hear It for the Boy, he wrote the lyrics, and because it, it was written directly for the screen. And uh, Holding Out for a Hero actually made an appearance. I was just watching a show the other day, The Way, Way Back. Remember that movie? If, if you haven't seen it, you should see it. It's really great. But Sam Rockwell, there's a, a, a nice little tip of the hat uh, for, for that song in, in the movie. Uh, my number three pick is Rock and Roll Dreams Come Through. And on any given day, that might be even my number one. That's such a great song. It was... Uh, it was actually first featured on Steinman's uh, solo album, 1981, Bad for Good. And I really like his version. Uh, it, it lead vocals are actually by Rory Dodd, who I, I mentioned before, who's a frequent collaborator with, with Steinman. Uh, but the song is credited to, to Steinman. Um, of course, later recorded by Meat Loaf for uh, Bad Out of Hell 2. And uh, his version went to uh, number 13, I believe. Steinman's version, I think, went to number 32, if memory serves. And um, uh, no, 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 I think that, was it was it Meatloaf's version, I think, went to number 14. Number 13, number 14. Uh, 13. It went to number 14 on the rock charts for Steinman. So it, it did well on the rock charts. Uh, let's see. Really don't know. Thank you very much. First discovered Jim Steinman Meatloaf in the eighth grade with Bad Out of Hell 2. It quickly led to the first album and a love for them both. Such memories. Rest in peace. Yep, I, I totally agree. So, yeah, so it went to number 13. Meatloaf's version went to number 13, went to number 11 in the UK. Rock and Roll Dreams come through. I just think, uh, I mean, it's a love letter to rock and roll, just celebrating 
how it's always there for us uh, in times that test our souls, like what we've just been through. And I love the lyric, you know, you're never alone because you can put on the phones and let the drummer tell your heart what to do. Uh, Rock and Roll Dreams Come Through is just such a classic. It's just one of those feel good songs and uh, one of Jim Steinman's best. My number two, I'm going to get, man, this was a tough one because my these top three, any of these could be number one on any given day for me. But uh, my number two is Making Love Out of Nothing at All by Air Supply. Um, Kelly, I uh, hope you're feeling better, Adam. Three chords in the truth. Kelly Christian said, thank you very much. And Warren Sellers, dig your channel. I'm a student of it all. Even wrote a book about the stories behind the songs. Oh, that's great. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, so Making Love Out of Nothing at All, number two. Um, it's uh, the song is a reworking of the main title thing, uh, theme from the 1980 film uh, Small Circle of Friends, uh, in which, of course, Diamond wrote the score, uh, released as a track from their greatest hits album, which is right behind me. Uh, both this song and Total Eclipse from the Heart were they were both offered to Meatloaf, uh, which is amazing, but he turned him down, he had to turn him down because his record label would not pay Jim Steinman to use him. And so uh, they were actually, uh, um, they were going to be on his lo- uh, his album, uh, Midnight at the Lost and Found. So um, anyway, uh, it's just amazing that he wasn't able to do that because the, the label wouldn't pay him. We'll have to go into more detail there. Roy Bitten uh, and, uh, and Max Weinberg of course, keyboardist and, and drummer for the E Street Band played on both of these songs, and so that's what gives it that. Uh, he want he wanted them specifically for both of these songs, uh, making love out of nothing at all in Total Eclipse of the Heart. And um, so, anyway, th- it's a great song. In fact, we have the story behind making love out of nothing at all from both members of Air Supply. We'll be releasing that down the road. And uh, so we'll go into far, far more detail on that uh, from from them who were actually a part of it. So uh, anyway, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, let's see. But what would he not do for love? Mark Thompson. Yeah. <laughs> that was the question we always ask. What I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. What won't he do? Yeah, that was always the question. <laughs> Okay, so if you couldn't figure it out by now, my number one song for Jim Steinman is Total Eclipse of the Heart. Number one for four weeks on the Hot 100, Billboard's number six song of the year for 1983 and one of the best years ever for pop music. Uh, Song was nominated for the Grammy Award uh, for the best female pop vocal performance. Uh, worldwide, the song has sold, just the song has sold in excess of 6 million copies. It was certified gold by the recording industry, uh, by the RIAA. Uh, sales of over 1 million copies after its release. It was updated uh, for platinum in 2001. You know, with Total Eclipse of the Heart, uh, it's just a perfect song. Um, and Jim Steinman explained that he was trying to come up with a love song. And he remembered that he had written um, a song, a vampire love song. Its original title was Vampire in Love, if you can imagine that. If, if you listen to the lyrics, uh, Jim Steinman says, I really like vampire lines. It's all about the darkness, the power of darkness, and love's place in the dark. He also said, and I thought this was very interesting, Jim Steinman, that uh, he thought that Bonnie Tyler sounded like John Fogarty. And he wrote this song to be a showpiece for her voice. I thought that was very interesting. Um, later on, of course, covered by Nikki French in the 90s. It went to number two uh, in 1995. It just shows the staying power of Jim Steinman, uh, of his song. So just incredible how all of this, Steinman's career, just incredible, incredible career. And uh, you can't say enough about what he's done. And I just feel like, again, very underappreciated. And uh, Marty Steele, uh, more woot from Canada. Yeah. So I just, 
as I've gone through this, uh, this adventure of, uh, of really getting to know Steinman's career a lot better over the last week. Um, I just really appreciate where he was coming from, what he was doing, what he was about. And I think that anybody who digs down deep in inside of his, uh, his repertoire of, of songs and albums will just understand that uh, this was a man of many, many talents and we're, we're de he's definitely going to be missed. And, um, so play, play some Jim Steinman tonight, play it loud. Uh, start with uh, maybe these five or six songs. Maybe we'll, we'll, uh, as this, when the stream is over, we'll put uh, a playlist below so that you can listen to some of that either through Spotify or YouTube, but appreciate your support to her. Let's see. I just missed, uh, it's, uh, Horatio Jones. Thank you very much. So thank you so much. Uh, we uh, have gone way over time here. Uh, appreciating the great Jim Steinman. I think we'll, again, we'll, we'll do a piece on Bad Out of Hell. We'll do a piece uh, on, on some of these other songs, Making Love Out of Nothing at All. It's coming down the pipeline with uh, uh, with with Air Supply. And uh, we'll see if we can't get uh, Bonnie Tyler as well to do a piece on Total Eclipse of the Heart and go from there. But uh, really appreciate everybody out there. And uh, we'll talk again soon three chords in the truth and take care of yourselves. Thank you so much.